to Rattling the Stars. My name is Tammy Tucky, and welcome to my YouTube channel and this special podcast interview series. One of the most classic Christmas songs that can always be caught on the radio is the legendary Irving Berlin tune, White Christmas. And if you grew up in my family's household, it was an annual requirement to sit down with everyone and watch the classic film with the same title. And so many people know that Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney and Danny Kaye and Vera Ellen were all in this film. And one other wonderful person who I always loved her outfits and I thought she was the cutest thing in the world in the film was also featured and that was Anne Whitfield and she is on the phone with me today to talk about White Christmas. So hi there, Anne. <laughs> hi, Tammy. Oh my gosh. Now you, so, so you were, if we're, if we're going to be very technical here with people who are listening, Anne is th the last living lead character from the film. And I, I, one of the, it's one of those films that if you grew up watching, you know, singing in the rain and the musical was the biggest thing to come to the screen. And that's what White Christmas was. And before then, you were doing a lot of other projects prior to the film, and I'd love to highlight some of them. So what was your beginning in the entertainment industry? Was it commercials or, or radio? Um, it was radio, yeah. I began in 1945 when I was seven years old on the epic uh, radio series One Man's Family, which actually ran, I think, 29 years. But I was only part of it for... I can't remember, from 1945 to about 1957, something like that. So that's like, tw I had a 12-year run. I was a member of the family. Um, I began when I was seven, but this member of the family had been in Europe um, during the war. This was right after the Second World War, and then repatriated with her family, but she hadn't lived with her family. She had uh, been in a concentration camp, according to the story. So that was me. That that was when the character was introduced in 1945. And then I went on and did some other radio series. I did His Honor the Barber, and I was uh, one of the two daughters on the Phil Harris LSA radio show. That went on for like five years, I think. And then uh, they started doing some television, and I did a few movies, but nothing nothing spectacular like White Christmas. Uh, but I did do several uh, television shows as guest performances. I also did a daytime soap opera version of One Man's Family right after White Christmas for a little over a year. That was right before I graduated from high school. And then I did start doing commercials after they began being produced in Hollywood, which didn't happen until like 19, the late 50s, maybe. It, it seems like Hollywood was was just the glitz and glamour. I That's how I always took away from it when I was a kid watching these films. And I would always study these books that my dad had in his little library about Hollywood and what it looked like and the sets. And it's, it's yeah. legendary, right? Because they're really, again, yeah. there weren't iPhones, right? So we can't document everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure nobody right. wants everything being documented back then. <laughs> Walking along the back lot, if something could kind of throw you back during that time, what would it be for you? There was one night that I was working on a, an episode of One Step Beyond. Um, it was a beautiful series, a half-hour series that was shot at MGM at Metro directed by John Newland, and it was about supernatural. It was kind of like Twilight Zone, except Twilight Zone was total sci-fi. Uh, One Step Beyond uh, always had something authenticating each each episode, and it was a, an um, anthology. And this one was called If You See Sally, and it's the moment in my career I'm the most uh, proud of, uh, because I played Sally, and Sally was a girl whose little brother had died in a drowning accident when Sally was supposed to have been watching him. And the father blamed her for the brother's death, his son's death, and banished her from the home. And then she came back um, 
tried to come back to the home when the mother let her know it was okay, it was safe to come home again. And then she got killed on the way, except she kept trying to come home for years after this took place in Arkansas. And for years afterwards, she supposedly was seen by people on this road stumbling along because she was mortally wounded trying to get home. And it was, uh, so this night that we shot, the accident and the stumbling along the road in the rain was on the metro back lot. And that was, that. when you asked me the question about back lot, that's what I thought of. The rain was done by machines. Yeah, they had these huge spigots up high in the air, several of them, and I was drenched the whole night. But it was L.A., you know, so it wasn't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't as cold as it is on the East Coast. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Gosh, did you ever walk down? I, I know a lot of stories come from the commissary is that a lot of people would run in, into mm-hmm. each other during lunch and just sit and oh, yeah. talk. So, Isn't that funny? I was just thinking about that a couple of days ago when I knew we were going to talk. You and I have not used that word commissary, have we? In our previous conversations, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. The only reason I use it, it is because they. In my head. But each each of the major lots had its own commissary, and I can picture the Paramount one, and I can picture the Metro one, but I can't picture any of the others. But I'm sure they all have them. Warner's and Columbia, you know, RKO, they all have their their commissary, and yes, people would meet up and have conferences and just conversations, very friendly, very noisy, very cheerful place. Usually people were on their lunch hour, and I say people because it would be um, not only the actors but all the crew, of course, and maybe just some droppers in like agents who wanted to try to meet up with people. And, uh, And they'd only be there for a very specific time, and they had to be back on set within an hour. So... There, there was this kind of pressure and excitement, you know. <laughs> so it was very loud. Oh my gosh, I can <laughs> only imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yet, Did, stand in line. I think. I think it was like a, I don't think they took orders. You, you had to it do it like, like a cafeteria. Yeah. Did Did you have a favorite commissary meal? I always ask this question because oh. apparently, you know, I heard that they had really good meals sometimes. Well. And that's my general memory, but I don't remember specific ones. I do with the Brown Derby. You you had been there before? Oh, yeah. I went to the Brown Derby a lot. The one on uh, Hollywood Boulevard. What was it? Oh. I can't remember the Highland. Vine Street. Vine Street. That's it. Okay. The one on Vine Street and uh, close to Hollywood Boulevard. Everybody would go there from the movie industry and the radio industry, and they had cartoons of everybody on the wall. Each person would have a portrait cartoon, Mm -hmm. and the waiters were wonderful. They were white tablecloths, white linen napkins, you know. And my favorite thing there was the cold vichyssoise soup. Ooh. Yeah. (laughs) That sounds very good. Now you're making me hungry. (laughs) Yeah. I wonder, do do you think that they might have kept, I I wonder if anybody kept any recipes from the Brown Derby. that's an interesting idea. I wonder. Well, I wonder if they even let them out because it was very special, you know, and very elite. So I don't know if they, I'll have to Google that, see. It was always unusual to me that nobody ever did like a TV show about the Brown Derby. (laughs) That's a wonderful idea. You should do that, Tammy. Hey, I'll do it only if you make a cameo. (laughs) Okay. That's the deal. You better do it pretty quick. You know, I'm 82. (laughs) Yeah, you just turned 82, too. So happy birthday, by the way. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The original Brown Derby was on Wilshire Boulevard, by the way. And it was in the shape of a hat. The restaurant was in the shape of a hat, and it was close to that wonderful old hotel. Was it the Ambassador? Was that the name of it? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a I lot used of to live near there. And the lucky thing is, I'll tell I'll tell our listeners. Um, I was able to find a great uh, DVD um, two disc set of White Christmas with behind the scenes features. 
um, one of which includes a tour of Rosemary Clooney's house. Mm -hmm. And they they have a couple of the costumes from the film, and they're beautifully preserved. I I thought that they had my pink velvet dress in that. It looked like it. It looked like it, but it it okay. wasn't because I tried looking that up. They only have Mary's Mary uh, Wicks dress, and it does oh. look that pink dress does look very similar to yours, but it's not. Huh. I know that's okay. what I thought. I was like, I was hoping mm-hmm. they they'd have it. Um, the fact that they've survived <laughs> for this long, technically, since we are approaching what is it, the sixty fifth anniversary? You think? It's coming up? Mm, more than that. Well, the film was released back in 1954. 54. But mm-hmm. you were shooting the year prior, correct? That's right. That makes sense to me, yeah. So if we were if we were going back from, let's say, 2023, if we're, we're subtracting, if we're counting when you right. guys shot it, 1953, it will be uh-huh. 70 years in 2023. Yeah, yeah. So just for the fabric to still be intact would be kind of amazing. Oh my gosh, yes. It, if if it's out there, so maybe maybe somebody might have purchased it at some point in time when they did that kind of sell out of all these mm-hmm. costumes and props and things. Mm-hmm. Did, so so you were you were around 15, 16 at the time. Right. Uh-huh. 15, yeah. And what's unusual is, you know, there are a lot of films they usually have a lot of kids on set. You were basically, if we're going in technical terms of age, the only teenager on set who was a minor. Right. So exactly, yeah. So were your day your days were different in structure? Can you like take us through one of those what, what like a regular day for you? Yeah. Um, my whole day, including lunch on the lot on the Paramount lot, could only be eight hours. This was according to a a California state law. And I had to have a relative, usually, uh, well, in my case, always my mother. My mother and a teacher slash welfare worker with me at all times. I could only work for four hours. That includes rehearsals and makeup and hair and wardrobe. I could only work for four hours every day, go to lunch for one hour, and I had to go to school three hours every day. There was no rollover. And the software worker always has a round stopwatch in their pocket. Well, my teacher, welfare worker on White Christmas, was a woman named Peggy Cobb. She was a Phi Beta Kappa. She was very brilliant. She was also a chain smoker. Everybody smokes in those days, but Peggy spoke. Cigarettes all the time when she was teaching and everything. It was crazy. And she was very, very nervous. She, she made me nervous. She was so nervous. But she was a good teacher. And she had to teach me everything, you know, English and science and math and everything. So I had to get Peggy for three hours every day. So as soon as I was through with a shot, as soon as I'd say cut and print, I would dash over to the table in the dark corner of the soundstage, or if I had a little bit more time, we would dash out to my, there was a trailer outside on the street right outside the soundstage. It was more comfortable and better lit for going to school. But usually it was right there on the set. I mean, away from the set where they were shooting, but on the soundstage in the corner that I would go to school. And uh, I think my table was often a makeup table with, with those lights around the mirror, you know. And I just have to dive into my schoolwork real quick and try to learn something and or read something and comprehend it and or maybe take a test because the teacher had to report my schoolwork, what I had done, and any test grades back to my uh, regular teacher at Hollywood High School where I was going uh, every week. So it was quite a pressured schedule. It was really disciplined and chopped up and very difficult. Do you remember the table read? But did they have a script slash table read prior to I filming? I wasn't there. 
<laughs> I was <laughs> wondering if they ever did. Um, and one of the things, one of the supplement things that you sent that that are on the disc that you sent me talked about the rehearsal that they had a month rehearsal before, but I wasn't there. Yeah, they didn't have you for for a dance scene. Did did do you remember if maybe your audition or anything was qualified to have you dance? Did they ever ask you to? No, 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 I didn't have to dance. Did you ever take lessons? Maybe not in regards to White Christmas. Oh, did you ever take dance yes. lessons? Oh my gosh, yes. I was never any good, but I was on toe on point when I was uh, seven years old, I think, or maybe eight. I took. Wow. Classical ballet, modern ballet, tap dancing, modern dancing. I took everything you can think of. I took dialect lessons. I took uh, swimming lessons. Um, yeah, I was busy. I was busy. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me wonder, what if they had given you a dance scene with somebody from the film? Oh. Who, who would you have loved to dance with? <laughs> Johnny Brasha. <laughs> Either him or George Jacuris. Either one would have done just fine. Oh, did you have a crush? No, no, I didn't. But uh, <laughs> they were very attractive and incredible dancers. Just incredible. Oh, my gosh. That would have been so cool. Like, I can picture... Yeah, I know. I can picture the scene now, like, y y your character asking about dancing and they're going, oh, uh -huh. you want to learn a step or two? You know, like one of those setups. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can, that would have been very interesting. But uh, the closest I came to having any association with the entertainers, the rest of the entertainers besides the, the quartet, was the scene where uh, there was a party and I'm kind of walking around just with a tray and drinks or something. Yes. Handing the out drinks to people from a tray, yeah. Yeah, the the cast, but also engagement party. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. You're the cute dress. That was so adorable too. I was like, I, I I was trying to pinpoint you in all the scenes when I was rewatching it too, and I was like, oh, there mm -hmm. she is, there she is, and mm -hmm. it was really cool to see that you know they were still including you in the background. I wish they would have kind of mm -hmm. brought you a little bit more forefront. Be you know what I mean with some well, scenes. It's a funny thing about that that part, Susan, I think that originally she had a, a bigger part in the show. And then they wrote me almost out entirely. And then during the shooting, I think Curtis kind of liked me and he kind of felt that I would add a certain element of innocence uh, as, as a kind of Greek chorus watcher, you know. And that's what I became. He started dragging me into every scene almost that took place in the in the lodge there. Um, but I didn't have any lines in a lot of them. Or sometimes he would add a line for me during the rehearsal of the shoot right then. But, um, yeah, it was strange. When you were, you know, kind of observing you know, during shooting, if you weren't in a scene or you you had finished your part, I know you only had limited amount of time on set. What were, what were your observations of, of the actual scenes filmed, the musical numbers and, and how they were being structured and, and executed because they look very, very complicated in the shooting aspect. They were very complicated. They would sometimes take a whole day to do that and and in that case I would have half my day off and I could watch or I could go home and do something else so yeah I was very impressed with how complicated they were of course they were all overdubbed so they didn't have to get the sound perfect because the sound was already there and it was being um, um, what do you call it projected what do you call it with sound yeah like um like a uh, I, I know what you're saying because Rosemary said it on, on the commentary yes. was bas basically they uh -huh. just would count you in and then you would shoot that song. They would just do a playback, playback. Playback. That's, that's what right. it is. Yeah. And, and so everybody would hear that on set and you would just make the motions and, and you didn't have to worry about how it sounded. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that was pretty cool because the motions were complicated enough as it was. If you had to also worry about the quality of the sound, that would be even tougher. So sometimes they would take all day to do just one of those numbers. Sometimes it would be lucky if they could do it in a day. Because they had to shoot from different setups. You know, they had the camera, and um, it would shoot like a long shot of everybody, and then it would, so you get that right, cut and print, finally, after 20 takes, maybe. And then would push in and do just two out of the people. And then you'd have to get that right. And it just was so complicated. And then the editor had to put it all together, of course, afterwards. Were so, there yeah. were there dailies during this time? Dailies. Well, I never went to them because, of course, I couldn't. I couldn't stick around that long. I'm sure there were. Yeah, I didn't know for because, sure if like they let you see or let anybody see like what they had been doing. I didn't know if that was kind of prominent during this time in film. You're right. That's a very interesting point. It was very prominent. Some some few people refused to ever see their own dailies. They didn't, it would weird them out to watch themselves on screen. But most people, I think, liked to, and certainly the editor, the script supervisor, the director, the cameraman had to see them because they had to make sure they had gotten what they thought they had gotten. But um, I was, I, I never could, I think the only dailies I ever saw of myself well, they were after I was 18 and didn't have to abide by those uh, stringent laws, you know, the time constraints. And there was no way I could come back to the lot after dinner and see dailies with my welfare worker, teacher, and my mother <laughs> and the stopwatch. <laughs> but I do remember that um, Rosemary was so sweet. I, I really liked her so much. She she seemed kind of preoccupied, and I think she was with her marriage. I think it was not a happy marriage with Jose Ferrar, but she was so sweet. She just was a very kind, cheerful, lovely person. You you had mentioned, I think we had talked about it, but we didn't realize out of the, the, the quartet, she was the youngest. She was 26. I, yes, I couldn't I believe it. I didn't realize it. it at the time either. Um, yeah, she really was young. So you two were, were closer in age than she was with Bing Crosby, because <laughs> he was oh, in his yeah. 50s. And, yeah, and I had no idea. Because, you know, she seemed mature. Her voice was a little deeper. Certainly her singing voice was deeper. So she just seemed a little more mature. than. I'm so surprised to learn she was in her 20s then. And, and Vera is supposed to be the younger sister. And I totally buy that when yeah. I watch the film. I'm like, yeah, she's the younger yeah. sister. <laughs> yeah, but she, she wasn't, no. No. I, I, my favorite part of the film is is seeing, you know, Danny Kay make Bing Crosby laugh. I think everybody and really enjoys yeah. that sister yeah. scene. Were you there that, that day? Or did you hear anything no, about that day? I, no, no, I didn't. No. <laughs> In fact, the idea of Bing breaking up really surprises me <laughs> because he was very morose and, you know, just kind of negative during the whole thing. He he had he had <laughs> seen it and done it, right? This wasn't the first yeah, rodeo. He, he was no fun. He had a wife who was dying of cancer and he was in love with Catherine Grant, who was 18 years old and hung around the set quite a bit. And it was just weird. Oh, geez. he was he talk about preoccupied. He was really preoccupied. And he had a bad back. I think he was in pain the whole time from his back. And he was uh, now, now that sounds that that sounds like the dancing must have made that even worse because he was actually doing technically a lot of dancing as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, his other films. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting you say that because um, because in the uh, behind the scenes featurettes um, and through, you know, documentation online that I found is that um, Donald O'Connor, who was a dancer himself and, you know, from singing mm -hmm. in the rain fame, um, he mm -hmm. was the first person to be, you know, be in that role for the Danny Kaye role. And then he got ill. 
Right. And then Danny Kay came in. And I'm mm-hmm. assuming, I'm assuming that they had all these dance sequences because they thought Donald would do all of them with Vera because he had already done, I think, another mm-hmm. film with her, right? Call Me Madam, I think it was. Oh, yeah. I don't know about that. But yes, that makes sense. W- what was what was the dynamic between between like all of the main cast? Because there were a couple scenes where all of you were together with the general. I don't know. I don't know about questions like that because I was literally snatched in and out constantly all day long. So your your schedule was very concise and precise, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was and like in and out. Up, yes, yes. But any any kind of well, nobody stood there for the lighting. Nobody was on the set for the lighting. The stand-ins did, mm-hmm. but um, the the rest of the cast would sit around in the famous canvas director's chairs, you know, the folding director's chairs with their names printed on the back of them. And uh, so they'd sit around and they would schmooze, but I had no schmoozing time. So I don't know what the dynamic was like. And and your your little group was basically Mary and the general. And, uh, yes. and, yes. and yes. Mary seems so funny. What, what was her person? Yes. Was she just, is she a comedian just like she was in real life? <laughs> I don't think so. I, she was very professional. She was very nice, but, uh, I don't think she was funny all the time. And, and what about your, uh, your grandfather in the film, the general? Well, yeah, he was a sweetie. Um, I, I enjoyed him a lot. And we had some contact later at CBS or something, some totally other thing. And and he was really nice. You get that warm yeah. sense that you really, it does come across that both of you do, you, you're very in, endearing to one, one another. You know what I mean? I think that's mm-hmm. my mom's yeah. favorite part of the film. Uh-huh. Well, it, yeah, I I think it is to a lot of people. Because there's just something familial about it, you know, and there isn't about the other stuff. And, and the quartet is kind of uh, split between Vermont and New York and their careers and, and, and the past, too. But the family is the present, the grandfather and, and Mary Wicks and me. And there's no, never any explanation about why my, what happened to my parents. Because there's no backstory for these stories. They're kind of superficial, you know. But uh, there was, yeah, you're right. There was kind of a nice relationship there. And I think it came across. I, I enjoy watching the movie with my family. And I will really enjoy, I don't think I've ever watched it with my little grandchildren who are seven and three. They're my youngest grandkids. I, I've watched it with my grandkids who are grown up from year to year, you know. And that's the fun thing. Oh, there's Nani. Look at her. Look at the pink dress. Do you still have the pink dress, Nani? <laughs> that's fun. It's not fun by yourself. Oh, no, no. It's it's all about the experience of sharing it with your loved ones. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you were asking me about what the legacy of White Christmas is. And I think that is the legacy. Because I think families have a tradition. Some families have a tradition of getting together and watching it every year. And uh, it, it's just, it's like a ritual, you know, it's like a sweet ritual. So for me, when I was watching it again, I'm, 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 I always know, I know the film from start to finish, but it's so fun I'm because sure. every time I watch it, I see something I've never seen before. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I was noticing that you're right. in the background during the, the, some of the sequences and you're, you're communicating with some of the dancers and asking them for drinks or, you know, asking if anybody wants sandwiches and being around the general. Mm-hmm. And you notice those little things. And it's what makes the film so unique is that it's so natural, but it was so, it, it yeah. was perfectly planned, basically, right? I think it was the cast. I think the cast was very responsible for that. I think there were some ad libs going on, especially between Kay and Crosby. And and I still die over the the costumes, like your pink dress and the sisters' blue dresses and Vera's like mm-hmm. purple pink dress and that scene where she dances with Danny. And I'm like, I can't get mm-hmm. enough of it. I'm like, I, I I want every single outfit in this film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
know. It's, it's Edith Head was so brilliant. What was she like to to kind of work with? Because Rosemary said that she preferred dressing the guys as opposed to the girls. Yeah, that I saw that comment and that surprised me because she was so good at dressing girls. She was kind of wry, you know. She kind of a little dry and wry, and she always wore dark glasses as if she had an eye problem. Um, very diminutive woman. She was probably in her 50s at this point, and uh, she had a very large office, which uh, would let somebody stand on a round pedestal, I remember, for pinning up hymns. (laughs) Speaking of bodies, figures, I had an 18-inch waist then. Oh, my. Okay. And I had deliberately gotten back there by doing a hundred bend overs every night before I went to bed for two years before that time. Like when I was 14 and 15, I did that every night. (laughs) Well, now I'm adding this to my list of things to do (laughs) before bed so I can look as fabulous (laughs) as you. (laughs) And hey, we didn't we didn't talk about Danny. What was what was Danny like? Was he basically the oh, class he, ca- clown on set? <laughs> the clown, yes, he he was wonderful, but big heart too. You know, he was so much fun to be around. He makes me laugh so hard every time I watch the film. I'm like, even though mm-hmm. I know the line coming up, <laughs> his yeah. voice cracking yeah. makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was just amazing. Do you know that he conducted orchestras? No, I did not know that, no. Yeah, he did. He did other things besides acting, and of course you know about the UNICEF stuff. Did he, was he doing that at the time? Like, did he talk to you about what he, had, what he would do outside of filming, or? Nobody ever talked to me. I couldn't talk to people. <laughs> I had Aww. no time to talk to people. The one time I remember talking to anybody about anything was I I approached Bing and I told him that I loved his performance in a movie called Little Boy Lost, which was a total drama. And he was, uh, it was a very serious movie and black and white and, and just beautiful. And he was so beautiful and understated in it. And I really liked his performance. And I told him that, and he said, Oh, Jesus Christ, I didn't do one goddamn thing. So oh. I never talked to him again after that. Oh. Not, yeah. not the greatest experience to hear. No. That's a shame. Year old. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that that's not the way you talk to a to a kid. Mm, that sounds like Mr. <laughs> Grumpy. Giving you a compliment. Yes. yes. I'm sorry to hear that. I, I am sorry yeah. to hear that. I am just so lucky and blessed that we talked today because this girl, this 24-year-old just called you up, (laughs) was like, hey, (laughs) um, were you in a film? (laughs) And and I got to say to our listeners, Anna's been so sweet with me because I have so many questions and and, uh, she's been answering them prior to our, our conversation today. So, because there really wasn't any documentation. I'm surprised they never officially interviewed you about doing the film. So to, to hear some of your stories today, I think this is fantastic. I'm, I know a lot of other White Christmas fans are going to freak. They're going to be like, what? This is great. You know, more fun stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have enjoyed it very much, Tammy. Thank you.